Lindenburg County's heritage and to Bridgewater's story, but now it's so much more. A hub of art and culture. A home to events and celebrations, to the things that we hold dear and that make us special. To experiences that are universal. And now, we need you. The Bridgewater Museum Commission is looking for new members. For just a few hours of your time each month, you can help the museum grow. Help shape programming to welcome new residents and to make them feel at home. Help to tell stories that need to be heard. And help Des Brise Museum thrive as a center for heritage, art, and culture in our community. For more info or to apply, visit bridgewater.ca slash serve. I'm Amanda Fancy. I'm the dealer owner of Gals Home Hardware and Furniture. We've been at this location for about a year. We started in 1848, uh, way back when. Um, this is our fifth location, so um, you know we've we've never uh, have left the town limits. So when we're looking to build this location. You know we had lots of opportunity to potentially look at home, you know, outside of the town limits. Um, but it was really key for us to be um, and continue to be um, a growing business in Bridgewater. Bridgewater, Nova Scotia is unique. We have a beautiful countryside. Our, our town is 7,500 people, but then, you know, our customer reach is about 45,000. So, you know, we're talking about lots of small communities, um, you know, hidden treasures. There's huge opportunity here, and I think that it's certainly worthwhile to, uh, to make the visit, uh, make the call, do some inquiring, because it certainly is uh, somewhere where I think there would be some uh, you know, strong investment opportunities for sure. My name is Joey Richard. I come from Quebec, Montreal. Um, I've studied opera at the Montreal Conservatory of Music, so this is where I've learned about Italian, the language, and the food. And my passion just became bigger and bigger for food. I've been cooking for 20 years, almost. I opened a family business, but the only thing I forgot is that my family is still in Montreal so I'm like you know I'm trying I make new friends I, I I'm building this thing but it is a family business here my chef is like my brother his wife is like my sister so I mean I, I recreated a family uh, environment we do the real recipes starting from the real ingredients and for Italian food what the secret is few ingredients and very fresh so each recipe would be like three four ingredients maximum but i mean it's just the best ingredients and makes it so delicious if you think that it's impossible to have your own business i'm the living proof that it is possible people want us to thrive we work together so it, everybody helps each other if you want to be part of a community it is the community to be part of My name is Joel Holland. I'm the owner and operator of Manitou Athletics. 
I found the opportunity, started this gym in my parents' garage, and now we are currently in an 8,600 square foot facility. A lot of people come here because of the community. The, the things that we offer here are different than a normal gym. It's an open atmosphere where you come in, the music's played over the loudspeakers, not in your ears. You don't put earbuds in and uh, just walk around from one machine to the other. You, uh, you focus on yourself, but at the same time you get to meet new people. We have three floors, uh, which we do CrossFit, uh, boot camps, athletic training, and personal training. We have so many other businesses that are growing our economy and uh, and feeding into it becoming more populated, a place where people actually stay as opposed to leave. We're growing, we're getting bigger, and um, a lot of people are on the same push to become uh, a, a better Bridgewater. I love this place, it's my home, um, and there is no other place that I want would want my business to be. Good evening, folks. We'll call this regularly scheduled meeting of Bridgewater Town Council to order. Uh, the agenda has been circulated. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Hearing none, can I have a motion to approve the agenda circulated? Councilor Thorburn, seconded by Councilor McDonald. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Um, announcements. Um, I will just remind folks that this week is Volunteer uh, Appreciation Week. And so uh, we thank, once again, thank our volunteers, not just in the town of Bridgewater, but all in Lunenburg County. Um, we have an exceptional number of volunteers that put in an incredible amount of hours. And so um, it lifts the whole community up. And so thank you very much for your giving of your time. And also the uh, proclamation that will be on the town's website is that the Shriners Children's 100th anniversary of uh, founding line, uh, Lyme Disease Awareness Month uh, is May uh, 2022, uh, 2022. So it's May is Lyme Disease Awareness Month, um, and a hundred years. Sorry, and a hundred years for the Children's Hospital. Those are two different things. Yes, <laughs> and I just read them off in one. <coughs> so spacing counts. <laughs> are there any other announcements from members of the council? Thorburn. Well, I did represent the town at uh, <coughs> of Bridgewater at the opening ceremonies uh, a week ago Thursday for on April the 21st actually for the at uh, a mirror place in Liverpool for the under 13 uh, AAA hockey tournament, provincial tournament. There was actually eight teams there. They played 15 games and I believe one game was played at the LCLC, mm -hmm. a playoff game. In any way, uh, everybody had a great time. 
Picto defeated Tass in the championship, so they'll represent the province in PEI for the Atlantics coming up soon. Everybody had a great time, and they had good corporate sponsorship, and they uh, especially thanked the town of Bridgewater for a spot from that tournament, so I guess I'd pass that along. Great, thank you. Any other announcements? Uh, Councilor McDonald. Just plucking up the Craft Beer Festival is this weekend at the LCLC, is it not? It is in May. It's in May, okay. May I'm way ahead of myself. This weekend in May. It's my home <laughs> day, I think. It's, yeah. Is no, it? 21st. 21st. Oh, it's really the May long weekend, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. Close. Yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to help you out. Tried. Tried. <laughs> um, there is a food truck festival on Sunday, May 15th uh, in downtown Bridgewater on King Street from 4 to 8 p.m. So that was uh, just announced this weekend. So that's exciting um, to see that pack. I mean, summer's approaching, kind of means things are starting to open up a little bit more, so that's good news. Um, any other announcements? I'll just note that our, our, uh, our representative volunteer, Sterling Ray, um, is going to be here, but he's running a little bit behind, so we will, we will do that after. And uh, before we continue, I'll just uh, note, as we always do, that Town of Bridgewater is in Mi'kma'ki, uh, the traditional unceded uh, ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people, and we are, uh, as always, fortunate to be here. And we'll move down to delegations, because our delegation <coughs> is here, so I'll ask uh, Jonathan and Blaine to come down, representing the Bridgewater Tennis Club, and give us an update. And the, the podium is yours. Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan, I'm the president of the Bridgewater Tennis Club. This is Blaine, a member at large at the club. I uh, just wanted to come here this evening just to address the letter we would sent to council a couple weeks ago. Um, over the late fall last year the repairs were about 90% complete to the courts. Um, we still have the lights to swap out, we just have to wait for the ground to firm up down there on the uh, field before they can bring the truck out there to finish that up. But uh, the repairs are done to the surface. Um, you know, basically, we just wanted to come tonight just to um, say thank you for the town's support in getting that uh, done. Um, in the letter that we had sent, uh, basically, the project overall cost uh, budgeted for one hundred and six thousand five hundred fifty dollars, and we actually came in a little under budget at one hundred and five thousand one hundred and seventeen dollars. Um, about 93,000 of that was um, gained through multiple different grants, um, the town, mobile support, uh, provincial, federal grants. Uh, the town itself, or the, uh, the club itself, put about 16,000 into the repairs. Um, that includes um, in some in-kind donations that we had for some of the installs and stuff like that. So uh, we had the, um, the roof is fixed on the clubhouse. Uh, we still have a little cosmetic things to do for the clubhouse, but. Um, other than that, uh, the repairs are mostly done, so hopefully um, you know, that will last us for quite a while. Um, the club is still committed to moving to Generations Active Park um, whenever that uh, becomes uh, you know, more of a, a reality. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, the, uh, the repairs that we do have done to the courts now will, will last us for, for the foreseeable future, hopefully, as long as we don't get um, too many more uh, cracks or, or whatnot. There are a few that have developed over the winter, but the uh, company that did the repairs are going to come back and uh, fix those up. They gave us about a one-year warranty on, on cracks and repairs and stuff like that. So, um, uh, And I also just wanted to, uh, we have a few little membership numbers um, over the, the, between the 2020 and 2021 um, season. Uh, overall in 2020, this includes adults and youth members. Uh, we had 193 members. Last year in 2021, we accumulated 273 members across adults and juniors, uh, with the biggest gains coming in the 18 to 30 year age, we went from 10 members to 24, and in the 41 to 50 years, we went from 45 members to 73. All the other ones were close to about the same, up or down a couple, but uh, really showed that a lot of people wanted to come out and play tennis. It was uh, one of the more uh, safe and uh, easily accessible sports during COVID. Um, we were able to run our courts. We actually had three instructors last year, which is the most we've ever had. 
uh, with the few grants that we got for some salary wages this year, it looks like hopefully we'll be able to hire three again. Um, we've also restructured our um, membership um, fees a little bit. Um, we're hoping to take some of that money and put it towards a, a capital fund. We have kind of a capital charge that we're going to put in there um, for each membership to put in towards the move to Generation of Active Parks. So we're going to try and start saving now. Um, and do, we'll still do some fundraising things throughout the year and things like that, knowing that that's, that move will hopefully come eventually. And uh, we look forward to doing that. You want to say, Blaine? Um, just a couple of things. Besides the funding, thanks for the community support. I'm not sure people realize that the project you've been working on for the last five years <coughs> has helped you grow the tennis in the area and helped grow the awareness in the area. And as John mentioned, over the last year, two years, the number of people that were safely able to access recreation and the stress relief around COVID is a tribute to the volunteers of the club and the community support for being able to do that. The original, me being a rookie, I'm a, I'm a rookie to Nova Scotia, so seeing the support of the membership and the volunteers grow the club over the last five years and the membership increase over the last five years is a credit to what you're doing. John's comments about the move to the new facility might provide more access, might pro provide more uh, community awareness of where the place might be. There's nothing wrong with the facility, except you guys aren't coming out to play. <laughs> Some of us in the room are. <laughs> <laughs> and John and I wanted to make sure that from the letter and the comments that if you folks had some questions about the process, that, that was important for us to be here. Are there any questions from members of council? Council Thorburn. Here's the deal. I'll come play tennis. You come play pickleball. Let's get that out of the way right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, and, and I know being involved with that facility for a long period of time, there always had been a drainage issue. Was anything ever done to try to alleviate that uh, as best we can understand that we are moving? No, we were actually having this discussion earlier that there is still quite a bit of water down sitting there in that low-lying spot. And I know a few months ago when I first went down there, sort of when it started to warm up a bit, there is still quite a bit of water that, that lays in that area. And I'm not sure if um, maybe that there's something clogged with the, the drainage there now. I have a couple photos that I'm going to probably forward along just to see if maybe there's something we can investigate there, but um, I don't know. Besides backfilling it in with a whole bunch of gravel, I'm not quite sure how we would alleviate some of that. Hopefully at least the water is not getting quite over to where the courts are. It does like to sit in that low area and that's kind <laughs> of where all the runoff must be settling. Um, it doesn't help the clubhouse much because most of that water sits under the clubhouse, but yeah, I have a few photos that we'll, we're going to try and investigate a little bit to see if there's something that maybe we can do with that. But it is still a pretty large issue down there. Okay. Yeah. Other questions, Council? No, that's great. Appreciate the update. Yep. Uh, and I know we have uh, we have later on in our meeting um, received a letter regarding the move to Generations Active Park. And yep. So yep. That'll come back later on this evening. Okay. That's great. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. See you over there. See you at the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I believe our our uh, representative volunteer has arrived. So um, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mr. Sterling Ray to come on down. And they'll come right down here. You get to come down front and center. Okay. The deputy mayor will come. <laughs> in February and March, through uh, social media, website, and local radio advertisements, residents were asked to submit nominations for the Provincial Volunteer Awards. Four nominations were received, the nominations were reviewed, and an award recipient was selected by the Town's Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Advisory Committee. Out of the four applicants, Sterling Ray was voted as a recipient of the 2022 Representative Volunteer Award. The provincial awards recognize volunteer services by individuals, teams, or groups who have enhanced the image of or have made significant contributions to the town of Bridgewater. Sterling has spent more than a decade volunteering as a youth program instructor with the town's recreation department. With a genuine passion and enthusiasm for the outdoors, he offers Bridgewater's youth the opportunity to build skills and leadership through adventure, exploration, and science workshops. 
Sterling will also be recognized at the Provincial Volunteer Awards Ceremony in Halifax in September 2022. Congratulations, Sterling. Thank you. Thank you for all your time you give to the community. No problem. My pleasure. And, uh, hope, uh, hope everything's all up and clear for September because that, uh, that award ceremony in the city is quite special. And, and well deserved. Well, thank you very much. We are certainly a community of volunteers, there's no doubt about that. Uh, we have the minutes of April 11th, regular council meeting there, including the budget approval. Are there any questions or errors or omissions with those? Hearing none, can I have a motion to approve the minutes? Councilor Conklin, seconded by Deputy Mayor Tanner. All those in favor? Those opposed, motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, correspondence for information, we have one of which I assume is going to be a number of letters we're going to end up receiving. This is from the municipality of the District of Guysboro uh, and Property Valuation mm -hmm. Services Corporation regarding the Non-Resident Deed Transfer and Property Taxes Act that we just found out passed. Um, I, be I believe. We believe passed on Friday. Um, so I'm not sure these letters are going to arrive with the ability to, to do much change. Um, I'll just add that, that through the NSFM and maybe Deputy Mayor Tanner, you can speak to it a little bit being on that board, but I, I, I think it's safe to say most, if not all, municipalities are not happy with, um, with this. I this would say most, yeah. if not all. <laughs> <laughs> I'd definitely say all are not happy about yeah. it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and one of the repercussions of this is um, uh, our Director of Community Development and I were at a session a couple of weeks ago and heard from an individual who was prepared to set up a business in Lunenburg, in the town of Lunenburg, employing like a net new business, employing uh, a large number of people, and he cancelled that. Um, and for him, he was a, a native to Lunenburg, lives in Ontario now, but always wanted to, to bring one of his businesses <coughs> back to his hometown to kind of give back. Um, and from his perspective, he felt quite betrayed by the province where he was uh, from to to in his words treat him as an outsider and to a to a different standard and punish him with uh, extra taxes because he's not a resident here his second it's his second home so he's a seasonal resident here um, so part of that is not just the actual tax on the properties but in this case we have an individual who is now not creating jobs so as these letters and this kind of communication gets back to the province, there's always the ability to change their mind. So um, that's so why that letter is there. So I just confirmed that I think it needs royal assent, but it's gone through the readings. No. Okay. So we'll see where where this lands, but right now it's going through. So. Uh, down to correspondence for action. Uh, we do have uh, an item from the Bridgewater Tennis Club. Um, and they, the members spoke to that earlier t uh, during their presentation about the relocation of the tennis courts to Generation Active Park um, and specifically uh, having that in the 10-year <coughs> capital plan, which it is in the 10-year capital plan. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you wanted to speak to that. Or? So I believe it's uh, Council had uh, placed, a, I believe it was $2,000 in a reserve and it was allocated um, they had intended it for their club improvements and um, so what they're asking is that that be reallocated for the move or repurpose to be put towards a move to Generations Active Park when when um, that, that portion of the development is ready to occur. So it's in a reserve now I think can we probably would just have to re uh, by motion state what the purpose of that reserve would be change it from clubhouse repairs or, or club repairs, I believe it was in general, to um, Generations Act Park move the council. You can do that now or you can wait until the time comes. But they're asking for it to be designated that way now. Okay. Questions or comments on that? <laughs> um. So yeah, so we, right, like you said, we don't really, it's it's sit, it's on standby right now. It's in reserve right now. So Kim will be coming forward at some point soon with a report on reserves. 
and maybe at that point it might be timely to if we want if, if it has a classification or we want to define the reserve better um, council can can do that at that time as opposed to doing it um, just as a one-off it might be nice to have all those motions cleaned together. up yeah, yeah that's a good idea everyone go with that mm -hmm. All right, um, and then our next item, 8.2, is Senior Wheels Association request for winter storage of Senior Wheels bus. So the request is to, to be able to use the Bridgewater Memorial Arena where we're presently storing our own transit fleet um, to have that, to be able to be available to uh, Senior Wheels during the winter season. They know the reasons why the snow and the ice that accumulates on top of the buses. At this point, um, it's a request that's come to council. If council's prepared to entertain it, I would recommend that it be referred to staff to, to investigate. Um, there's op there could be operational impacts, but there's space in, in the future planning for the arena that may, um, former arena that, that may have to be considered when considering this request. Yeah, and and the term too, right? Mm -hmm. So if it works for the first <coughs> couple of years, does it work? Like, is it a lease that comes back or a not a lease, but a zero dollar lease or something that comes back every year or something yeah. that renews. Yeah, because certainly we do have plans for that bottom floor over time. It's just, we may, it may be good for a year or two, but the um, staff should be consulted about the operational impacts and what the expectations would be in terms of access to the building right. and how we kind of separate that from what we, our own, our own portions that we utilize now. Okay. Any questions on that? Deputy Mayor? Uh, just be ready for a motion. Sure. I move that Council for the Town of Bridgewater refer the request from Senior Wheels Association for winter storage of its bus as contained in document 22-061 to staff for report and recommendation. Thank you. Seconded by the entire side over here. <laughs> 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 Council Thorburn. Further discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, we are down to reports and recommendations and the Heritage Advisory Committee. I see uh, Mr. Chris Bedford is here to um, talk about the annual report. Good evening. Your Worship, Mayor Mitchell, Town Councillors, I would like to open by thanking you for the opportunity to present the Heritage Advisory 2021 Annual Report. To say that the HSHAC has had a very demanding year is an understatement. Top of the list is, of course, the direction given by Town Council to address the renaming of Cornwallis Street. The HAC sought input and guidance from the residents of Cornwallis Street, residents of Bridgewater at Large, and the Anti-Racism Task Force with the assistance of town staff to reach the conclusion that Cornwallis Street should be renamed. Town Council accepted this, rec this recommendation and had further guided the HAC to re select a replacement name again with input from the residents of Cornwallis Street, the residents of Bridgewater, the ARTF, and the selection process. As of this presentation, the name change from Cornwallis Street to the accepted Crescent Street is proceeding, which also came to include the renumbering of the existing residences on the currently named <coughs> Crescent Street. Town Council decided, arising from the discussion regarding the naming and renaming of locations within Bridgewater, that new policies regarding this process needed to be written. So again, under the direction of Town Council, the HAC was tasked to develop these new policies. In consultation with the ARTF and with the assistance of town staff, the town asset naming, renaming policy, and street park and trail naming and renaming policy were presented to and accepted by Town Council. Continuing with its mandate to promote the preservation of Bridgewater's heritage, the HAC undertook the following. Each year, the HAC selects a property within Bridgewater that demonstrates its intent to preserve the heritage and historical significance of that property and to publicly acknowledge that commitment. For 2021, the property was 127 Queen Street, known as Verge House. They were presented a certificate at Town Council meeting acknowledging their commitment to preserving the heritage of the property. To further acknowledge the seven built heritage properties named to date, the HAC developed and had produced a brass plaque to be, pre to be presented to each recipient. To date, because of COVID restrictions, only three plaques have been presented, those being 126 Pleasant Street, 39 King Street, and 163 Pleasant Street. Remaining properties to receive plaques are 553 La, La Have Street, 483 King Street, 
629 King Street and 127 Queen. The HAC members were shown the extensive process involved, involved in identifying and evaluating a potential municipal heritage property during the application to proclaim 126 Pleasant Street such a property. This involves an extensive researching of the history of the property from its construction to the current measures being taken to preserve those features and how those details offer a significant impact to heritage preservation in Bridgewater. It did receive that designation. So in addition to being named a built heritage property, 126 Pleasant Street has also been designated a municipal heritage property. Another project of the HAC in 2021 was that the final two road signs were installed in the Brookside Cemetery, thus completing that project. Going forward, the HAC has updated their action plan to establish and include the committee's priorities for the next three years. Examples being, to expand the process and create a list to identify and evaluate built heritage properties, which will also enable the HAC to approach these designated properties for further discussion to become municipal heritage properties. From this, to develop a centralized database to improve access to the information gathered for all evaluated heritage properties. To explore the establishing of a heritage grant incentive program, similar to the current facade program, to offer a financial incentive for property owners to preserve the historic, historic integrity of their properties. To create and implement a public events program to educate the public on the heritage sites in Bridgewater. This could include possible guided tours of the designated built heritage properties and Brookside Cemetery, as well as the development of interpretive panels to be placed along the Centennial Trail, depicting the historical significance of a certain area on the trail. Some proposed topics of the panels are Glen Allen, near 360 LaHaye Street, to commemorate the Miller House, which is sometimes referred to as the first house built in Bridgewater, the Davison or Glenwood Mill, located off of LaHave Street at the bottom of Silver, Silver's Hill, to commemorate the significance of the Davison Lubber Company to Bridgewater, the Railway Bridge, to commemorate the significance of the railway to Bridgewater, Riverview Schoolhouse, which had been a municipal heritage property, Sebastopol, located near the Wild Carding Mill, to commemorate the industrial heart of Bridgewater, and to develop interpretive panels or panels, displays or panels, to highlight and educate on other his historically significant areas within Bridgewater. Proposed possible sites for these panels being the Champlain Bridge, referred to as the Old Bridge, Tannery Park, located on King Street across from Pine Street, Glenwood Park, located on King Street across from Parkview High School, the Bridgewater Foundry located across Victoria Road from the Wild Carding Mill Museum. All of the projects involving the development of interpretive panels and displays are of course long-term projects that will require an extended investment of time for research and careful budgeting to achieve the final ends. But we feel they are the projects well worth undertaking to continue the, to preserve the heritage of Bridgewater. <coughs> Excuse me. In closing, I would like to thank the Mayor and Town Council for the direction and support. The town staff that were, are an immeasurable asset to the HAC. The chair and members of the Anti-Racism Task Force for their past and future input in our deliberations. And also especially to my fellow members of the Heritage Advisory Committee for your input and efforts. They are greatly appreciated. It has been a very productive year. Respectfully submitted, Chris Bedford, Chair, Heritage Advisory Committee. Any questions? Any questions from members of council? My question is, how, how long, how many years have you been on this committee? Only three. Only three? Yeah. Are you sure? I feel like you... <laughs> yeah, that's right. Three. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm thinking of the uh, Friends of Des Yeah. That was 20. <laughs> that we know. Yeah. No, I was, just, I was just thinking, like, it's Volunteer Appreciation Week, and, and you've, you've been before council many times working on behalf of all things heritage. Yeah, but that's just quietly in the background. Oh, <laughs> but you're a hard worker. So <laughs> this is this you know. is the most vocal. <laughs> well, we we appreciate. We appreciate Thank you very much, time, Chris, and and, for and you it will committee. not be quiet in the future. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Good morning. <laughs> no, yeah. fair enough. Any uh, other questions or comments? No, that's great. Thank no. you for okay. that. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thank you.
All right, next item 9.2 <coughs> is a police patrol vehicle. I see our deputy chief is here. Um, so we, we knew we, uh, a while ago we ordered one electric and one gas. I'm here for Scott, who's on a much needed vacation. So go ahead. <laughs> um, do you want to just run us through uh, the purchasing the one, one car? So yeah, so we uh, did a RFP for a new gas uh, vehicle uh, that's included in our capital budget of the one forty-three thousand that or one hundred thousand that we had in the uh, 2020, uh, 2022 and twenty twenty-three capital budget for the electric vehicle and the other Merck vehicle. So uh, we did get one response to the tender. It was from Saunders. Uh, Motors Company for a 2022 Dodge Durango Enforcer. That cost is $50,789 uh, and with a 13 week delivery date, so basically the middle of the summer, and the town's cost will be $52,966. So that will replace our oldest vehicle that currently has 141,000 kilometers on it. Uh, typically we put around 45 to 50 a year on a vehicle. That one's actually we've been using less because it has transmission problems, uh, which is why the miles have gone down this year. Um, so obviously it will be important to replace. And uh, we've checked with our approved seller and our approved um, equipment operator, and we can get all the gear in it under the capital purchase for both vehicles. That's great. So this is, re is this replacing the last car? Is this replacing the Taurus? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Yeah. yeah. Because every now and then you see all the cars are black, but then there's one white, white one. one. <laughs> yes. You yeah. just see it, it, it kind yeah. of stands out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's the last of that. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, any questions on this? We've had the EV for well, three no, weeks. A month. I'd say three weeks now, yes. So, and we're still waiting for the gear to get outfitted. Of <coughs> course, when they told us when we purchased it, it was two months for either the gear or the vehicle. The vehicle came in three weeks, and the gear is extended. Mm -hmm. So, because of all the shipping issues, so, but yeah, we're we're supposed to get it deckled, I believe, the end of this week, and then the gear's starting to come as well. So that's great. Um, Kasukawa, what is the? Um, we had budgeted one hundred forty-three thousand for the two vehicles, I think. Yes. So remind me what our bottom line is now if we approve this. We're over by. No, we're not over at all. Under. We're still well, under. Well, we're still under. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Any other questions? Ready for a motion? Yes, please. Okay. I would move that Council of Town of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the Chief of Police or an award tender 22 02 Bridgewater Police Service supply and delivery of one 2022 or newer black police spec vehicle to the only bidder, Saunders Motors Company Limited, for a 2022 Dodge Durango Enforcer at a cost of 50000 $789.50 plus HST, $52,966.34 net HST with a 13-week delivery date. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Fragier. Further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. Thank you, Deputy Chief. Thank you. Our next item uh, for information really is monthly permit applications report for March 2022. Uh, the town continues to be busy, um, quite busy. So permits are uh, up again. Um, so uh, I, I don't. The government's trying to cool the market. They're not. Uh, <laughs> it's not really having an impact quite yet. So people investing in the community. So that's great. If you have any questions, you can reach out to staff regarding that one. 9.4 is tender 22-01E King Street Cross Culvert <coughs> Replacement. And I see Mr. Davidson's coming down to go through this one. I feel like this one just keeps coming back. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. Like the never ending story. So as, as councils where staff have tried unsuccessfully to tender this last year, uh, both the supply and install once in uh, last summer and then just the supply only uh, for the culvert and both times we came in over budget. So the matter was deferred for budgeting and February 14th, uh, council uh, gave staff the pre-budget approval to go ahead uh, to, uh, to draft that tender which was done in March. 
uh, an issue closed on April Fool's Day. Uh, and luckily, uh, we did receive one bid, uh, and that bid was almost right on budget. Uh, that bid was received from Dexter uh, Construction Company, who we know has the experience, the knowledge, and the capability to do the project. Um, so, and the budget is six hundred thousand dollars, and their uh, their cost is in the tender recommendation is six hundred and sixty-two thousand four hundred, including HST or the net portion of what the t town pays of six hundred thousand eight six hundred and eighty-seven dollars and thirty-six cents. So, just a little shy of seven hundred thousand dollars, seven hundred dollars over budget. That was scary. Um, <laughs> so, given that, given that the tender submission is close to budget. And we know that the, the poor condition exists in the infrastructure uh, and the potential major impacts if a failure staff do recommend that the project be awarded. Uh, recommend to Council that for the Town of Bridgewater the ten award of tender 22-01E to the lowest compliant tender, Dexter Construction Limited, for an estimated total cost of 662400 including HSD, net value of $600,687.37. Net HST and the funding um, over expenditure would be through operational reserves. Prior, the only thing outside of that six hundred thousand dollars to be spent would be uh, public work staff do need to go in to install two gate valves uh, in front, leading and lagging the area, so the water can be shut off to allow for the work to happen. Thank you very much. Questions on this? Uh, when is the anticipated? Date. The tender specific specify the date to, for it to be done uh, through the dry months, so it can happen anytime after June. Uh, but we specify during not during school, so July and August for the work to be done. Uh, so if uh, subject to the award, tomorrow staff will issue a letter to them to start looking at those dates to get some in, uh, let the public be aware of what's going on in summer. And just for the. the Public that are watching, can you just explain exactly where this is? So we so know it's, we it's know around it's on King Street, but yeah, it's a, it's around the uh, civic number of 1021 King Street. Uh, so I, I can't remember the park. I think Bill, he, the person who was just here, noted the park name, and I can never keep it yeah, straight. Up near Parkview. Yeah, up yeah. near Parkview, correct. Glenwood. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Other questions? Someone prepared to make a motion? Councillor McDonald. Uh, I remove the town council for the of Bridgewater endorse the recommendation of the engineering department and award tender 22-01E King Street Cross Culvert replacement to the lowest compliant bidder uh, tender, Dexter Construction Company Limited, for an estimated total cost of $662,400, including HST, $600,687.36 net HST, Funding the over expenditure through operational reserves. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Conklin. <laughs> Further discussion? Any questions being called? All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. This will be Thank good you. to get done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, 9.5 recommendation of the Director of Finance uh, donations to South Shore Field House um, Society. So this is. Um, Normal, just a reminder that we're not really. The motion would be to give a grant, but it's people have made donations. They re, the town receives them and then um, passes those on to the field house society. So I know every now and then I get a an email or a, a phone call saying you make an awful lot of grants, give an awful lot of grants to the field house. So again, just explaining that no, it's people giving donations. So is someone prepared to make that motion, Councillor Caldwell? <coughs> Excuse me. I move that council approve a grant in the amount of thirty-five hundred dollars to the South Shore Fieldhouse Society for the multi-use facility on Glen Allen Drive from funds in the designated community fund, South Shore Fieldhouse Society. Thank you. Seconded by Deputy Mayor Tanner. Discussion. Hearing none. All those in favor? Those opposed. Motion is carried. Thank you. And another recommendation from the Director of Finance or a uh, grant for the Lunenburg County Multipurpose Center Corporation. Um, just wait for my refresh here. Uh, and so this is for the purchase of skating helmets. Um, so it's $1,700 and a little bit more than $1,700. Is someone prepared to make a motion for that? Councilor Conklin? I move that Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve a grant to the Ludeburg County Multipurpose Center Corporation in the amount of $1,785 
for the purchase of skating helmets as outlined in document 22-066. Seconded by Councilor Fischer, and that's that's being done through the United Way. The United Way has uh, per we town receives a donation from the United Way, so it's a similar type of arrangement where we're kind of an in and, in and out, yeah, yeah, providing the grant to the corporation. Perfect. Any questions? All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. And now we're down to 9.7 strategic priorities update and quarterly reports. All right. <laughs> So you have <laughs> the, the uh, strategic priorities update uh, on your agenda, and you also have the quarterly reports from every uh, department within the town. So my intention was just to highlight for council the strategic priorities and what has been accomplished during the last quarter, which would be from January to the end of March 31st. And um, the quarterly reports are there, and if you have any questions, then we're certainly here to to answer those. So during the last quarter, which would be the final quarter of 21-22, uh, we have under your priorities with exit 12A, the master plan of marketing, staff through the community development brought forth uh, draft amendments, uh, with, which would outline how um, the land north of the 103 would be proposed to be designated and zoned um, to uh, be kind of step one in preparing for marketing the lands. So that has gone out for public consultation and staff will be bringing back the uh, report to council with the final amendments um, <coughs> shortly. And staff have also drafted a land sales policy which was brought forth to council through a discussion session to, to introduce that and uh, the final policy is being finalized and will be brought to council in May. With affordable housing, <coughs> we completed the planning strategy and land use bylaw options report. So we. Um, Community Development again brought forth a report with a list of options for Council to consider with how we could facilitate through our planning documents affordable housing and uh, they have started the public consultation process for that. I believe last week we had our first public participation meeting on the changes to the R1 zone I believe it was. So uh, we had a, that was virtual and we had about 30 people sign up for that. And a, a planning and analysis report will be coming forward to Council on that in the next quarter. In the Economic Development Strategy, Council completed um, the uh, review of the draft strategy and approved the implementation plan that staff had presented as well. So we're in the midst of implementing that and most of your strategic priorities going forward for 22-23 uh, reflect what the Economic Development Strategy had proposed as action. The open space plan, uh, the Community Development Department again brought forth a uh, plan and an implementation plan during the last quarter for Council in terms of how to implement the open space strategic plan and that was some of those things were reflected in this year's budget with this park signage that we have. And in terms of energized Bridgewater, there's a detailed report that's attached to this but there were some achievements during the last quarter that were brought uh, forward. So the investment system RFP, um, the RFP has gone out and, uh, and that was, uh, I believe with that one we looked at, um, yes, um, at an arrangement with ta ta Tapestry and that was brought forward to Council for approval and the HAMS concept document was also completed. With asset management, although not noted here, we did receive funding from FCM and that Council was advised of that just recently. So um, that was uh, a year-long wait, and get that. Uh, plan review, the uh, Community Development Department reported on the plan charter, so we brought that forth at a discussion session. And the organization review during the last quarter, um, I had brought forth, uh, it was requested by Council a report on the immediate needs, and we discussed that during our budget deliberations. So those were the things that were accomplished during the last quarter and as I indicated your strategic priorities chart which was it was also included in your budget document kind of sets forth the next year. So there's really no revisions required to that because we, we just update that with the approval of the budget. Any, any questions or comments on that? I love seeing things completed. Like I, I, I feel like there are some there's been some times where we just nothing, you know, everyone's busy, we get distracted by emergencies that come up and something's just going to be completed. So it's nice to get a report that says completed. 
completed. completed. So that's good. Councilor Thorburn? That's the only time I'm happy to see a red number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> completed. I Sir? changed it to green in the actual. Did you? Yes, because <laughs> red could be perceived as negative, too. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to the CAO, and uh, she'll reach out to staff. Um, 9.8, Energized Bridgewater Alternative Procurement for Axion Labs. Turn it over to our Director of Community Development. So yes, um, in November, um, in November, council uh, approved for us to enter into a uh, procurement uh, arrangement with Axion Labs Canada to fill a resource gap on uh, the data and information technology component of Energize Bridgewater. So um, we've been working with them, and this is a request to basically continue that arrangement. Um, we've completed much of the contract that we initially uh, entered into, short of actually launching the procurement process. And that really, so the documents are drafted, but we didn't actually uh, hit go on it. Um, but we did also bring on a junior resource into the team in January. Um, but this data and connected tech uh, component to Energize uh, continues to be uh, challenge and one of the larger risks to the project in terms of having that uh, advanced and experienced expertise on the project and so there's a lot of moving parts so we uh, there's a new program that Nova Scotia Power is launching and we spent a lot of time over the past number of months trying to understand the my energy insights program that Nova Scotia Power is bringing forward to all account holders uh, and how that jives with what we're planning to do in bringing forward a community scale energy management information system so that once the retrofits are complete how can you drive further efficiency by really truly understanding uh, the energy that you're using in your home and having that uh, additional support of advanced energy management offered to the community so that's really what the energy management information system is trying to build and and uh, and and deploy um, Another component to it is that we've been working with some other communities across Canada in understanding how uh, we can build this system and they're also recommending that we, um, as we go through the request for information process to be a pre-qualification to go into a proposal process, that we also develop a lab model. So we're exploring options to develop a lab model of the, of the energy management information system. Um, and so there's a diagram that I realize uh, didn't come out very well in your scanned document when I looked at it on eScribe, where we were looking at sort of the next uh, 7 to 12 months and what the major pieces are in this iterative loop to really understand this uh, technology component and how we can deploy it. So we're, we're looking at how we can pull all those different pieces together, understanding the business requirements of the technology, um, looking at the software requirements, and, and looking at how we can be really clear through the procurement process with what we're asking for. Because if we're not clear, we might procure something that we don't want, that won't integrate with our existing system, won't integrate with what Nova Scotia Power is doing, and will, will cost us an arm and a leg. So that's really sort of this continued process of trying to figure out exactly how to build that EMIS, and that's really what this is. We want to continue to work with Axion, um, and we are requesting uh, alternative procurement approval to do so as we continue down this pathway before we enter, uh, go to market for what we want. So we have clear understanding of what we then ask for in the marketplace. Questions from Council? So, I mean, I guess this answers the question of the, the My Energy Insights tool that NSPI is putting forward is not something that we can leverage directly to get the information. That's part of what we're exploring right, right. now. It's one of those things that when we developed our concept and put our application forward for Energize Bridgewater, My Energy Insights wasn't even, not even on the we radar. had no idea. Right. 
no clue. And only in the past few months have we been able to uh, be able to make some deeper connections with Nova Scotia Power to understand more clearly what the My Energy Insights is able to do, and we're beginning to, to look at the business requirements that we've been able to articulate that we're trying to do with energy, with the energy management information system, and see, and we're, we're still in process of then understanding how far would My Energy Insights get us. Because not everybody, it's just about power and your, your power <coughs> bill. But energy poverty is much greater than just the power bill. That might be a large part of it, but it's not the only part of it. So there's still other pieces of the energy management information system that we need to understand. Um, and how would that work with what we might be able to pull out of the My Energy Insights and understand that power use. In addition, there could be, you know, oil, home, heated homes, you know, water. There's all sorts of other components that would not be a part of what's being offered through Nova Scotia Power. Okay. I'll let that answer yeah. my question there. Other questions or comments? Deputy Mayor Chair. And so how does the City of Calgary factor in? They're, they've become one of the, the communities that we've been meeting with regularly. They have actually, uh, I haven't been in the meetings with them, but I've been getting the, the updates. And what I understand is they actually have a, their IT department. They use sensors for a lot of their environmental management. So they use sensors in their stormwater system, in their river system, uh, and they use, I don't know the right technical, uh, a Laura Wan, anyway, some type of uh, some type of communication network, and I don't know the right acronym, so I apologize. Um, but this Laura network, uh, which can um, can can receive uh, data from a range of sensors, um, and then bring it into their system to then make sense of that data and know are they at risk of a flood situation? So I think they deployed a fair bit of this after those floods in Calgary, however many years ago that was, um, and they've done some other things as well. So they actually have in-house expertise that has been building data and connected tech systems for municipal operations. And they have been giving us uh, very generously a significant amount of their time in sort of what their process has been, how they've built it in a municipal environment, what they're doing, and uh, they often do uh, what um, our IT resource has been calling a laboratory proof of concept. So they've built little mock-up networks so that they fully understand their business requirements before they go to tender, as I understand it. I can get more details for you if you'd like to know. No, it's just, it's, uh, yeah, it's just interesting. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're hoping that this, their project will, the amalgamation, the sensors, the amalgamation of this data to then make sense of it will then translate somehow. Yeah, they've been giving doing. us more sort of like insight on process pieces that then we're applying to our situation. Okay. Okay. So they're, what they're looking at and what they're monitoring is completely different than what we're looking at with Energize yeah. Bridgewater. Yeah, no, but their process <laughs> pieces have been very helpful and they really recommended um, doing this laboratory proof of concept. So we're looking at partnering with the community college um, and the Middleton campus, uh, Dr. Wayne Grosgo and his laboratory up there where they have uh, different pieces of, you know, household, normal household appliances. Apparently they have a whole like mock-up lab of a home. And so we'd be able to, to really put some of these pieces together and understand how they talk to each other to see if we will be able to get the type of information that we're looking to to be able to scale up a community scale energy management information system. Essentially what you're looking for is like you can buy smart plugs and, and things that measure your consumption mm -hmm. and things like that but <coughs> not at a community level, right? right. We, we can't buy 50,000 smart plugs and then hook them all into everyone's home and then somehow have one account to gather the data. But you're kind of looking for something like that, right? That is measuring. It's about the yeah, the those data connections. Right, and to yeah. find the inefficiencies, mm -hmm. right? I'm mm -hmm. just trying to think, of, like I have a couple of smart devices that literally measure the power consumption of the toaster, but that's just for one appliance and we're mm -hmm. looking for <coughs> something. I have multiple households. Yeah. yeah. Any 
other questions on that? We can certainly bring back a, a, at a later date as we have the business requirements more figured out and give a little bit more of an information update about where things are with the actual EMIS development. Yeah. Is someone prepared to make a motion? Or do you need any more information? So I, I just wanted to explain to Council the alternative procurement piece of it. Okay, thank you. Right, so normally we would, because of the value of, of the contract for the recommendations for up to 100000 with, with this firm to do this work that trade agreements as well as our procurement policies normally require that we would go to market and get competitive pricing or, or look at different proposals and, or in different approaches. But under the trade agreements as well as our procurement policy, there are instances where we are able to consider alternative procurement for specific reasons. And so what staff are recommending is that there's two clauses of your purchasing policy that would apply. First is um, 18F, where there is an absence of a competition for technical reasons and the goods or services can be supplied only by a particular supplier and no alternative or substitute exists. And so in this case, Axion Labs has been working for a number of months on this and to, to go out to market would result in having to probably repeat a lot of that work. Um, and then K, for the procurement of a prototype or a first good or service to be developed in the course of and for a particular contract for research, experiment, study, or original development, but not for any subsequent purchases. So that definitely fits the bill in terms of what we're asking Axion Labs to do as part of this project as well. So we feel confident that those two clauses would enable Council to consider alternative procurement. If Council's not comfortable doing that, you do have the option to direct staff to go to open market. Um, however, as I say, there are those risks in, in having to repeat work done and um, the ability to meet various milestones within a, within a contract with the uh, federal government. Questions about that? Is uh, someone prepared to put a motion for Council Fraser? Yes, Your Worship, I'm making a motion. Motion that Council for the Town of Bridgewater delegate authority to the Chief Administrative Officer to use alternative procurement practices up to a maximum of 100,000 in total expenditures within the next 12 months until March 31st, 2023 for data and connected technology consultant and advisory service from Axion Labs to support the Energized Bridgewater project. Thank you. Seconded by Professor Conklin. Discussion? Questions? Hearing none, all those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. 9.9 uh, .9 is the appointment of a, of a building official and I assume this is just a formality to put it on record. That's correct, so that this individual can do building inspections within the town of Bridgewater and it'd be part of our agreement with the District of Lindenburg to provide building inspection services to the town. Perfect. Is so, yes, Councilor Thurman? Yeah, so actually he'd be the only one that would be allowed to do? No. No, we've we, appointed others. We have a whole list of them that we appointed in December. Okay. Yeah. And so he just happened to be the newest one? He just happened to get a certification, so he's been going through training for a couple years and we just got a certification for part nine, so it would be okay. for um, or, or level one, one, so the house. Okay. Yeah. So you ready for the motion? Yes, sir. <laughs> I would move that council appoint Bruce Parks as building official under section five, subsection two of the Nova Scotia Building Code Act as per the terms of the agreement between the town of Bridgewater and the municipality of the district of Lunenburg dated June the 18th, 2019. Boy, is that long ago that we had that agreement? That well, that one, well, that we just we just continued with right. that one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Seconded by, <laughs> sorry, Councilor <laughs> Fragier. Discussion? Question. Question being called. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, we are down to business arising unfinished business. So um, this was, uh, we gave notice, I believe, at the last meeting for this one. So this is the uh, amendments to policy 89 fees regarding planning yeah so there's two fees that are proposed uh, the first is to increase the development permit fees from $25 to $50 and to increase the zoning confirmation fee to $100 from 25 and those were reflected within the budget uh, as well any questions on that 
If not, would someone prepare to make a motion? Councilor McDonald? I move the Town Council for the Town of Bridgewater approve the revised fees policy to increase the development permit fee from $25 to $50 and to increase the zoning confirmation letter fee from $25 to $100 and as presented in document 22-057 as policy 89 for the town, effective immediately. Thank you, seconded by Councilor Conklin. Any more discussion? Question. All those in favor? Those opposed? The motion is carried. And finally, 10.2, uh, again, we gave notice at the last meeting. This is proposed council video conferencing policy to kind of clean up a To allow it to, to happen. To allow it to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just a refresher yeah. that during the pandemic during the state of emergency the, the well, backing it up the municipal government act doesn't allow does didn't allow us didn't to do allow. this the state of emergency allowed us to have virtual meetings state of emergency ended um, and so we have to uh, amend our policy in order to um, allow this to happen so this would allow us to have virtual meetings hybrid meetings did I just like steal your all no, your thunder? No, there's some important detail. <laughs> okay, there. yeah, I'll leave that <laughs> to you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, the MGA was amended to enable councils to consider it if you want to. So it's not mandatory; it's optional. Um, but I believe it's something that council had indicated they were interested in. So the policy before you would um, follow the requirements of the Municipal Government Act, which essentially state that you have to give public notice of a virtual meeting if it's all virtual. And you have to do at least two days notice um, and five locations in the town um, and part of the criteria is that you have to be able to be heard and seen so everyone has to hear everyone and be able to see everyone and participants who uh, may be attending or watching have to be able to see and hear as well so uh, we need the video and we need the audio in order for that to happen um, in addition to that um, that if you if you lose that connection this policy states that if, if you lose your volume or you lose your video you're considered absent so the minutes would have to reflect that uh, it uh, further allows for um, a hybrid however with, with hybrid um, they, a, a counselor when when it's not a full vir virtual meeting so it's a hybrid meeting a counselor can attend virtually um, three times in a year so that excludes any time that, that the mayor calls a virtual council meeting. So this would be three times in a year that a uh, council can attend virtually, and it's, it's to accommodate the inability to attend. If there's a need to exceed the three times, then it has to be um, due to uh, an illness that would prevent the council member from attending in person, and they would need to, to advise the clerk, which would be myself, in advance of that, that that's why they'd be unable to attend. And, and that can be granted so the intent is to you know try to be in person as opposed to hybrid but it will accommodate that hmm. yeah and the reason for that three is also you know you're on council you should be on council not away for the winter for six months and this would prevent prevent that because the other trigger in the MJ is you miss three meetings in a row and council can you can be removed from council so, yeah um, we want to recognize that we are in a hybrid world without having uh, it abused so. the, the other thing to note there is that this also applies to committee committees of council as well so heritage advisory DPAC, uh, parks and rec they're all subject to the same requirements council mcdonald so if there are members of a committee of council who want to attend virtually do we, are the advertising requirements the same? Um, we don't it's just council meetings that are required to okay. be advertised there are some like um, unless there's a legislative requirement to advertise then no but okay. um, in that case they they're subject to the three three meeting limitation as well okay. other comments council Thurman where it says clerk could and we have a CAO could that be changed to CAO and eliminate the clerk on that document um, the MGA references clerk so uh, basically the MGA says where there is no clerk, it's the CAO, so. Well, that was my point. Yeah. I don't have one like I listed. Yeah. It's just to keep it consistent with how it's worded in the legislation. Someday you might have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other comments? Just, yep. Yeah, so that eliminates us having one due to weather. We couldn't because we have to give notice, right? Yeah. 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 Unless we knew, like, on the... 
on yeah, we, <laughs> we knew there was a big storm <laughs> coming. Yeah. yeah. Um, which, which we could. Yeah, but that to advertising to requirement is the same if we call a special meeting, right? Like you still need to advertise. You can, but the unless it's an emergency. Yes, there is, and, th and there is always. The, it has to be an emergency. So there is the fallback in the MJ that says that failure to advertise does not uh, may avoid a council meeting in the sense that you can still have it and and make decisions, but it's meant for um, special meetings. Otherwise, we have um, the issue is that we advertise our regular meetings. Right. So those are preset, public know. If we make any changes to that, they, they should know. But you do have the ability to to call an emergency one. Yeah, it is unfortunate for whether you know. can't, right? Because yeah. because you you're likely then not having a council meeting virtual versus having a virtual council meeting at the very least. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. it is what it is. Is someone prepared to make a motion? I'll make a motion. Thank you. That council for the town of Bridgewater approved the council video conferencing policy as presented in document 22-058 as policy 109 for the town effectively effective immediately. Thank you. Seconded by Councilor Conklin. Discussion? Okay. None. All those in favor? Those opposed? Motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, we have no new business. Um, we have an in-camera meeting uh, right after this. And um, it will be under Section 22.2e, Municipal Government Act for Contract Negotiations. Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Councilor Thurburn, seconded by Councilor Conklin. We are adjourned.